um, thanks first of all, Greg, for organizing this, for making this happen, and for the nice intro that we had about LA.NET Group. I've been with LA.NET Group for I think five years, and currently I am not in LA. So, and even then, I'm still associated with LA.NET. So I think that uh, in itself is uh, a proof that you don't have to be in LA <laughs> to be part of LA.NET. <laughs> um, so yeah, please, like we want more participants. We want more people to volunteer here. And if anybody has any interesting ideas, anything they want to present or any, anything that they want to talk about or chat about, feel free to use these groups, which uh, Greg has just shared in the chat. All right. So today we'll be discussing about the AWS uh, Developer Associate uh, certification. Um, and so, yeah, without any further ado, let's get started and feel free to interrupt me or in the, I've opened both the chat and the Q and A. So let me know if you have any questions, the more interaction we have, I think the more fruitful it will be for all of us. All right. So we will be discussing on AWS Developer Associate certification on why you should get that, what to expect in the exam, how to prepare for it, and certain important AWS services which are asked more often uh, in the exam as compared to other services. So we will be focusing um, on those. And then at the end, we have a fun quiz also. So um, yeah, you have to listen attentively. <laughs> All right. Um, so if you want to get the most from the next one hour of your life, then please, please, please participate. That's the only request I have. <clears throat> uh, quick note about me. My name is Abhishek Jain. I'm a senior developer at Cornerstone On Demand. The company is in Santa Monica. I also have a YouTube channel called Coach for Dev. Um, and with the same name, I have a blog also, coachfordev.com, where I upload uh, interview questions and their answers. Um, like uh, any technical interview questions that are asked that that come across. Um, I try to upload the question and its answer on my YouTube channel. So please subscribe to it. Then I'm a regular speaker at LA.NET and other meetup groups. I, have, um, I think I've been doing this. I started with LA.NET only and I keep coming here pretty often. Um, and then I also wrote one book called Mastering Web Developer Interview. It's there on Amazon, you can check it out. And I have a four year old son and I'm also a mentor to software engineers. So if, um, if anyone is looking for any kind of help in terms of interviews or on how to crack interviews and want to do some preparation, feel free to connect with me. Um, yeah, okay, all right. So for those who know me previously, like I usually start my um, presentations with a, a brain teaser, which usually has a stupid answer. So let's see, <laughs> um, let me know. Why was the cab driver pissed after asking developer for his address? You can put your answers in the chat. What did the developer reply to probably make it uh, annoying to the cab driver? Oh my God, okay. <laughs> I think yes, the first person got the answer. Oh wow, two people got the answer, exactly right, yes. <laughs> the developer replied 192.168.1.254. All right, awesome. So if you, if you are still here, that means you like the joke. And uh, <laughs> all right, so why should you get AWS certified? Well, um, anybody wants to say anything on this? Like why, why AWS certification is, is something that is important today? And Greg, at least you can unmute if you really want to. I mean, nobody else can. <laughs> No, no one. Everyone's waiting to uh, to find out from you. Okay. <laughs> it's one way to learn a new platform. That's exactly right, Joseph. Yes, yes. World is going to the cloud and everyone wants cloud ready developers. That's right, Paul. Exactly right. Yes, exactly. So the world is moving to the cloud. I, I think for... Um, 
any company that I can think of today, like any brand new startup, or if you think of any traditional companies, any big companies that are already there in the market, all of them are either starting on the cloud or they are migrating to the cloud. This is such a big game changer in our industry that there is no one that is that that wants to be left behind at this point. Everyone is doing some sort of cloud migration as of today, any big company and all the brand new companies, they are starting completely on the cloud. They don't want any kind of on-prem servers. They don't want to have any kind of data centers. And I think that's, that is, that in itself tells you the importance or, or, uh, or, uh, the, the weightage of this, that how important it is to get, uh, get a cloud certification. Now within the cloud, like you have major players like Amazon, like AWS and Azure and Google cloud. Um, however, if you can look, if you look at the market share, AWS is leading like way ahead of any other, any other competitor, even including Azure. Sure, Azure is at second place, but it's still like almost double the market, which AWS has captured. And AWS is like, Amazon team is working way too much on this. Like they're offering, adding new services every other, every month. Uh, if you look at uh, their uh, AWS Connect and uh, their conferences that they are doing, they are they are uh, displaying new services and new uh, new platforms within their uh, within their uh, console. You will see like they have a lot more offerings that are getting added every day. So AWS is something that that will really help you in terms of your your um, your job search and if you are looking for an upgrade. It looks good on your resume or LinkedIn profile, since this is still like in, um, in like, not everyone has, like you can't find AWS people like with 10 years of experience or 20 years of experience. So right now, the way anybody can judge you is like either like by asking you more and more questions or by your certifications, if you have AWS certifications. So this can help you set your foot into a, any company that if you have an AWS certification, you are more likely to get interviewed and then you can take it from there, right? Another major thing is the trend that is happening is our developer role is shifting more from coding, more towards deployment. So until now, like um, as a developer, like my, my job used to be like, I used to write my code and you, I used to send it to QA. And after that, I had no idea much about like deployment process that used to be taken care of by the IT team most of the time at any big company, if you go to, or even at a mid, mid seven, mid size company. But now with the, with everybody moving towards cloud, that role is also shifting. Now the teams are becoming more and more, um, uh, self-managing. Like they are, they are the ones that who, who will write the code as well as they will make sure of the deployment, as well as make sure that it is up and running in production or everywhere else in all the environments. That is your job as a developer, not somebody else's job. So this mindset, this role change is, is happening in our industry. And it's we sh like sooner or later, this will come to you as a developer. Also, you can't be spared from it. Okay. So, and AWS is the market leader. I've already talked about it. Now, in terms of AWS certifications, there are uh, three levels of certifications. First is foundational and under foundational, you have only one AWS certified cloud practitioner. Then you have associate level certifications in which you have developer associate, architect associate, and uh, sysops associate. And then under professional, you have two of them, solution architect professional and DevOps engineer professional. Um, so this one is like a soft prereq for everything else. Uh, cloud practitioner, this is just about uh, like different services that are available under AWS and terminology on what to use, when to use, uh, which one. And this certification is for everyone, including developers, including product managers, QA, uh, project managers, anything, any role that you are in. If you just want to learn about AWS and you have no idea about coding or networking, then you can take this certification, Cloud Practitioner. And then for developers or, or like networking specialists or SysOps specialists, as the name suggests, like these are the certifications for them. Um, the professional level certifications are, again, they are much more difficult than the associate ones. And these are hard prereq. So hard prereq means that if you have, uh, if you want to get solution architect professional, you need to have a solution architect associate. 
otherwise you won't be able, even able to sit for the exam and same thing for devops professional you need to have either developer associate or sysops associate to be to to be able to appear for the exam and then you have some specialty exams like uh, network advanced networking specialty security and all that stuff so if you want to go in some specific specialty you can you can learn that and and uh, go for it um I myself got recently like uh, developer certified, my AWS uh, developer associate. Um, I started like uh, learning on the cloud, like about cloud in August. And at my company at Cornerstone On Demand, I ran a weekly program in which I was learning myself as well as teaching those concepts to a group of people. Um, like there were about 15 of us in that group. And in December, all of us took the exam and all of us passed. So that is something like including me. So that is something that we did recently and um, I was happy with the <laughs> results. Um, okay, so now for developer associate certification, any, any questions so far, anyone? Okay, yeah, again, feel free to please put in the chat or in Q&A, okay? So as part of the certification preparation, if you prepare for developer associate certification, you will learn a lot of terminologies that are associated with AWS. Um, you will learn how to write, deploy, and debug your code in AWS. Um, all the services that are available, uh, although like not all of them, but yeah, pretty much like you will be touching upon a lot of them. And then tools to help you in the journey, like uh, like there will be a lot of tools that you will learn that okay, like uh, how to how to do it through command line interface, how to do something through console how to do something through other means, like what are the different possible options that you have. And you will get lots of hands-on experience also when you prepare for this certification. If you just think that, okay, I will be able to simply just read through it, then you won't be able to pass the certification. You will need to learn how to do that stuff. You will have to do some hands-on hands learning. Without that, like you won't be able to clear the exam. Now exam details real quick is like, it's a 130 minute exam. Um, it's all multiple choice questions. And in the multiple choice questions, don't just think that you will have simply like, okay, which service is used for what? You will, you will be actually probably given a lot of commands also, like in what order these commands need to be executed. So these are the type of questions to expect. It's all online proctored, so COVID free. You don't have to worry about uh, going to an exam center and, and, and like catching COVID. So, you don't have to uh, yeah, go anywhere. You can do it at your home. You just need a laptop and a web with a webcam and microphone. And as long as you have that set up, then you can take the exam from your home. And it's uh, $150 uh, cost and you get 50% discount if you have taken cloud practitioner before. So that is something a lot of people don't know. Um, but yeah, that will help you. And here is the link. I will share the slides deck later on. Uh, but here is the link for the developer associate like details if you wanted to get a look, take a look at those. All right. Now this is from the AWS website. Like uh, if you are uh, like, what are the what are the different components or the things that you need to learn for the certification, and what's the percentage wise? So like deployment, 22%, security, development with AWS services, refactoring and monitoring and troubleshooting. So you have like different services are available under each of these domains. So let's take a look at them. I will, I will touch upon these five domains in the next slide. Um, there are more than 175 services. So <laughs> don't get overwhelmed with the amount of services. You can't learn everything and not everything is going to be asked in the exam. So you have to understand that part. Like you can't, nobody is expecting you to learn all the 175 services. Okay. But there are certain ones which are more important than others. And that's what you need to understand when you uh, prepare for the exam so that you can, you can clear the exam easily. All right, so first one, first domain was a deployment domain. Under deployment domain, you have these uh, services like CloudFormation, Route 53, Code Deploy, CloudFront, Elastic Beanstalk, Code Pipeline, Code Build, Code Commit. Um, <clears throat> okay, I don't think I can cover all of them, but um, like I'll just quickly touch upon like if you were to use CloudFormation, for example, like CloudFormation helps you build your resources 
in a as a like infrastructure as a code so you can write your template in such a way that okay i want this virtual machine and i want this kind of uh, networking and i want this kind of database all of that you can write in one single document and then you can tell aws that hey please deploy these resources and it will do that for you so that's the job of cloud formation um i think yeah then the, like elastic beanstalk for example elastic beanstalk will help you get your code like for example if you write your code in dot net for example you can get it deployed to aws and you don't have to worry about uh, like starting everything from scratch like you have to run your own uh, virtual machines and you have to run your own database everything can be abstracted out and can be taken care of by elastic beanstalk uh, you just have to tell that okay using elastic beanstalk you tell that please deploy this code and it will automatically configure these things for you so yeah these are a couple of services and we will cover a few of them in today's slides okay under security you will have the first one like most important i am i am stands for identity access management it's like all about how you want for your account how many users you want to add how much how much access you want to give to each and every person or to each and every role to each and every service um, and all that so that you configure through i am you have secrets manager kms um, key management system then uh, cognito uh, it will help you set up your logins like for any application that you want to if you have your own web application or mobile application that you are creating you can do all that setup for your users uh, login and and uh, login log out and token related stuff all that can be done through cognito so that also comes under security then third domain was and this was i think the highest one 30% uh, weightage on the exam so development with aws services this one is um, on how you will do like uh, development like uh, if you were to write your own code and and get it deployed how will you go about it so ec2 s3 all these come under this ec2 stands for elastic compute cloud and um, this is the this is the major major service that you will be using a lot like when you go inside aws um, this is where your code will get deployed and you will be using this a lot more than anything else if you when you start on this s3 is for storage then you have api gateway a um, lot of command line interfaces clis sdks software development kits if you were to use um, any of these aws components uh, in your dotnet code for example then you will be probably using one of the sdks um, like there are sdks for everything for dynamo db for uh, s3 everything you will you will get sdks um rds is a relational database service lambda we will we have one one slide explicitly for lambda um i think in two or three slides afterwards um ecs stands for elastic container services so you will so as you can see like under development you have, you have lot more services than anything else and the reason being because this one is for aws developer associate certification it's more for developers Right. dynamo db as i mentioned earlier and then sns and sqs is a simple notification service and simple queuing service so you will be using them um, if you want to do anything asynchronous or any kind of queuing mechanism that you want to set up <clears throat> and refactoring uh, under refactoring i think that was a 10 or something like 10 or 12% uh, this domain um, and you will get some questions asked for like mostly step functions is the biggest topic under refactoring on how you set up step set up uh, set up step functions so that you can have um, some say lambda functions getting called one after another so you can do all that setup using step functions um, data pipeline and redshift so redshift is for mostly um, data warehousing so if you want to do some kind of analytics on some like lot of data on a huge amount of data then you will be probably using redshift for that purpose and the last cat domain under this was monitoring and troubleshooting um so this is for like your debugging stuff if you want to find out what happened when when this happened or why this error is happening then you need to understand that how to how to utilize uh, the 
the services that are provided by AWS in order to debug something, in order to find out the root cause, in order to see what happened, um, all that stuff. So you have like different services like CloudWatch, CloudTrail, X-Ray, and um, oh, I think, um, yeah. So yeah, these are the services that, that come under um, monitoring and troubleshooting. Any questions so far, anyone? No? Okay, I think I'm being super clear today. Um. <laughs> or no one is listening. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so next, we, what we can do is, uh, I'll be covering the important ones right now, uh, some of the important, one, important services, and then we have the quiz afterwards. Okay, all right. Um, so under compute, the first one, as I mentioned, EC2. EC2 is the most important service that that no matter which certification you appear for, I think you will be asked like maybe at least 20% of your questions will be roaming around EC2. So um, EC2 is something. So what is EC2? EC2 is, as I mentioned, Elastic Compute Cloud. It's like the virtual machine that is provided by uh, provided by AWS in which you can run or run something, you can run your own uh, application, you can run your software, you can do whatever you want with that EC2 machine. So it provides you all the compute capacity. And um, so when you, when you set up an instance of EC2, like you refer it as EC2 instance, and with an EC2 instance, you say that, okay, this is the operating system which will be running on that. So you will have either a Linux machine or a Windows machine, so you can choose that when you, uh, when you set up your EC2 instance, uh, you will set up your storage that, okay, this is the type of storage that I want to use and how much storage you, you want to use on your EC2 instance. Um, you will be setting up like, okay, this is the RAM, like how much, how big is the, how big is the instance? You will set up that also. And then one thing that I want you to uh, remember is AMIs. AMI stands for Amazon Machine Image. And this is like, so whenever you create a virtual machine, like in outside AWS, for example, you have, you, you can, you can uh, spin up a virtual machine using one of the images, previously stored images, which contains operating system and some pre like uh, some of the softwares that you want to, uh, that you want to get installed automatically. So instead of that, like you can use that image to spin up as many virtual machines as you want quicker as compared to you installing that same software again and again on multiple machines. So that's the exactly the same thing. You can draw an exact parallelism or corollary that this is the, like the AMI. So Amazon, Amazon machine image and Amazon machine image contains like your operating system information and everything else. Um, so you can, when you are spinning up your EC2 instance, you choose an AMI, you say that, okay, I want to use a Linux AMI. So you will choose that and, and then you will be, you will get Linux pre-installed and, and everything else that is associated with that AMI. So it's like a template of configuration for your instance. Any questions on AMI? No. Is anyone there? Okay, I see 16 participants. Okay, so people must be here. Okay, awesome. All right, yeah, Joseph, yes, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay, all right. Uh, Paul is asking, can you create your own AMI images? Yes, definitely yes. You can, uh, you can create your own AMI images. You can even, uh, you can even uh, save those images and, and uh, keep them either as private or you can make them public and you can even sell your AMIs. So there is a marketplace for that where you can create your AMIs and then you can put it for sale saying that if anybody wants to use my, my AMIs and you have to pay me, yes, that is also available. So good question, Paul. Anybody else, any other question? Cool. Okay. 
All right. Okay. So yeah, if like if you want to like if somebody asks you like how will you launch your EC2 instance with a desired configuration, you will choose the basically you do that by choosing the appropriate AMI. All right. Next one is EC2 auto scaling. This is something that uh, that is again very very important. And since I was covering EC2, I thought I'll touch upon this also. Um, EC2 auto scaling uh, helps you scale your application based on certain parameters. So, for example, like you say that okay, your you have your EC2 instance running and you are you are running your web web application, and uh, suppose you say that okay, if my CPU utilization goes above eighty five percent, then you can automatically ask the uh, set up your uh, your account in such a way that another instance will be automatically uh, started and then it will start sharing the load. So that way, your one single instance does not have all the load, and you can you can do all that setup. That okay, if suppose my one machine goes above eighty five percent CPU utilization, the new machine will be automatically spun up. And then the traffic will start getting distributed between the two two machines, and and then like uh, so that way like you have half the load on each of them. And then you can also have your rules like so you can have your rules to increase your uh, number of EC2 instances as well as decrease the number of EC2 instances, saying that say for example if my load is below thirty percent on and if I have more than two instances running, then please. Shut down one instance, so you can do all that uh, automatically. You don't have to monitor this um, during peak hours, during your high load times. You don't have to do all that yourselves manually. You can you can do that all um, in an automated fashion. So it will automatically add or remove EC2 instances. Uh, you can do it on based on certain conditions like CPU utilization, instance failure, and things like that. It helps in high availability. So that will make sure that your your system is more available, your application is more available, your uh, whatever application you are running, um, especially during peak hours, peak load, like that is one of the biggest problems that we have uh, for on-prem servers. That we don't know how much, how many servers we should deploy, because like if we deploy way too much, sure it can help during peak times, but the rest of the time it is sitting idle. Whereas if you deploy it less, like less number of instances, then during peak times. You have you are you are losing on traffic because you are not able to cater to all the requests. So this actually helps you maintain that elasticity and uh, in a very cost-effective manner. You only get you will only be spinning up more instances only when you really need it, and not something that you have to worry about. Like okay, it is now sitting idle and doing nothing. Okay, so it helps in high availability as well as it can help you with cost management. So because it can help you decrease the number of instances as well. Any questions on auto scaling? Um, no. Okay. All right. Next is elastic load balancer. Um, so as the name suggests, like it's like a load balancer, which will help you distribute your traffic amongst, uh, different, uh, like multiple targets. So you can set up a load balancer and say that, okay, this is now the, now the one that is facing the outside world. So all the traffic will come to the load balancer. Now the load balancer is the one that will decide that, okay, which server should go or which server should receive which request. Um, so you can do all that using load balancer and, uh, you have lots of configurations that are available, uh, different types of load balancers that are available, which work on different, uh, layers of the OSI model. So you can have like load balancers, which work on, say, I want to do it based on the application layer protocol or network layer protocol. So you can do all like, you can set up different types of load balancers there. Um, it provides again, high availability and automatic, automatic scaling as well. So if you like these go hand in hand, like most of the times when you do the setup, you will be doing load balancer and auto scaling group together. And that way you can, your load balancer will automatically know when you have new auto scaling, uh, when you have new instances that are spun up by, by load, by, uh, by the auto scaling group. So that way your traffic can be automatically, um, distributed. 
cool and it makes it more fault tolerant any questions on load balancer no okay um i think everybody is super prepared for the quiz <laughs> all right next one is lambda um so lambda is something that that there are three most important topics in the, for the aws developer associate exam and uh, lambda is one of them so you will be asked a lot more questions on lambda than anything else and does anybody know what lambda is or, or lambda what does it do why do we use lambda it's not c sharp lambda just to make sure everybody is clear on that <laughs> in the chat or in the uh, q&a anybody wants to make a okay james yes serverless functions exactly right yes um do you does anybody want to say anything like why is it called serverless Does no need to okay, not uh, Paul. Okay, uh, Paul. No, that's not correct. Like not connected to a particular VM. Um, but I think yeah. He, sorry if I am not pronouncing your name correct. Iswara Rao um, and Victor, both of you are correct. Yes, exactly right. You don't need to manage the server or infrastructure, or you worry less about servers. Exactly right. So when you are um, using like Lambda function, it's like it is called serverless, but actually behind the scenes, there is actually a server in which your, your, uh, your uh, code is running. It's just that you don't have to worry about it. That's why it's called serverless. But in reality, yeah, the code is running somewhere on some server. <laughs> so it's not completely serverless. Uh, but for you, it is serverless because yeah, you don't have to worry about it. You can't even you can't even see where that code is running or or uh, what kind of machine it is running on. So that's exactly right. Um, so serverless compute service, uh, it's a serverless compute service. You only pay for the commute compute time you use. So you don't have to worry about like for example, in case of an EC2 machine when you are running an EC2 instance. Um, so. Yeah, exactly right, Iswara Rao, yes. You pay per use, so it is less costly. That's exactly right. In case of an EC2 instance, for example, if you were to bring it up and like make it up and running, you will be actually paying for the time for which it is up and running. You will be paying for the storage, you will be paying for um, like, uh, yeah, the time for which it is running. But in case of Lambda, you don't pay for anything like unless and until it is, it is actually doing something unless and until any specific request is coming in and it is doing some kind of computation. So until then you don't pay anything. So that is the biggest, uh, biggest benefit of using Lambda. Um, however, there are certain restrictions also like in terms of memory and size and, and all that stuff um, and how much you can configure and how much uh, code you can add to the Lambda function. So there is a lot of restrictions. There is a lot of limits that, that are set on Lambda. Uh, but like in general for anything that is small or anything that is like uh, something that you can trigger based on certain certain trigger like you can say that okay if something if an event happens like this then i want you to process this code then lambda is one of the one of the go to choice for these type of functionalities okay um, it, uh, it is again, continuous scaling. You don't have to worry about scaling part and it's very consistent in performance and you only worry about the code part. You don't worry about the deployment part. Okay. Um, this is again from the AWS website, like on, like, uh, this is showing you that on an S3 bucket, some event is happening. And then whenever that event happens, then that Lambda is running and it's doing some saving or uh, like saving some more files to the database. So all that is happening behind the scenes and like you just do the setup once and then you don't have to worry about making sure that the everything is up and running or you don't have to manage about it. You don't have to do any kind of patching 
nothing at all. All this is done, taken care of by the Lambda. All right. Then we have one question. When should you use Lambda versus EC2 versus ELD? Each of them has a different functionality. Um, I'm not, I don't know your name, but anonymous attendee. Uh, so <laughs> each of them has a different functionality. Uh, EC2 instance is something like a virtual machine, as I mentioned, where if you want to control, okay, which is the, what type of, what type of operating system I want to use and you have more, uh, your needs are higher, like, uh, in terms of storage, in terms of your, uh, application that is running, then you will prefer an EC2. If you have something small that is running and if you wa don't want to worry about the servers that you want to manage and you have no such restriction on that, then you can use Lambda. And ELB is completely different. It is like load balancer. So you will be using ELB along with something like either EC2 or Lambda or maybe something else. So load balancer's job is to distribute the load amongst different, uh, amongst different uh, instances or Lambda functions or things like that. Okay. Okay, anonymous attendee, sorry, by ELB, I meant Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk is, okay, no. So ELB stands for uh, Elastic Load Balancer, but sure, okay. The Elastic Beanstalk is something that you use just simply for deployment purposes. Elastic Beanstalk will actually be starting some EC2 instances or some database or whatever you have configured. Like that's what it is gonna do behind the scenes. Elastic Beanstalk is not doing, is not running your code anywhere. It is just using one of these mechanisms or one of these things to, to do that. Um, Elastic Beanstalk will be starting some EC2 instance, will be starting some database, will be doing whatever your application needs based on how you have configured or whatever you are trying to do. So Beanstalk is not something, yeah. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so that is answered. And then Joseph is asking, can you host a web API MVC or server side blazer on Lambda. Yes, you can, you can have a uh, API on, on, uh, you can deploy your API using Lambda. Definitely. Yes. Um, yes, exactly. Or your server side blazer. Yes, definitely. Right. Yes. You can do that. You just can't have a UI component to it. If you were to write your full blown MVC application with a view proper, then you won't be able to use Lambda for it. But if you were to use only API functionality, like server side functionality, then for that, uh, that is uh, like Lambda will definitely suffice. All right, awesome. That means people are awake. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions, anyone? I really like the questions, so yeah. Please keep them going. All right, next let's uh, jump on to uh, some network. So under network, you will be first thing that you will have to understand is VPC. VPC stands for uh, virtual private cloud. So it's like um, you are running all these things like your EC2 instances, your databases and everything else, but where will those run? Where will those be hosted? So for that, like you will have to learn about VPC. So VPC is like a chunk of uh, IP addresses which are assigned to your account. And those, those, those is like, so those IP addresses or those set of IP addresses belong to you. And now you will be deploying your code or sorry, you will be running anything that you want to run all the resources that you are, you are running. Those will be, uh, done like in, on the IP addresses that are allocated to your VPC. Um, you can have, you get one VPC, uh, per, per region by default. And then you can get up to five VPCs. If I, if I remember correctly, you can get, yeah, up to five VPCs is free of cost. And after that you will have to pay. So if you were to get more, uh, if you want to get more VPCs after that, uh, yeah, one VPC per AWS region by default, you can create custom VPCs and it associates with the IP address range of your choice. So you can choose the IP address range that you want, and those will be associated with your stuff. Like, this is for your, like this will be the private IP addresses where your resources will be up and running. All right. Then next thing under uh, networking was uh, API gateway. So 
if you have like multiple APIs that you are exposing, or if you want to manage your APIs together, then API gateway is one of the best way of doing that. Um, suppose you have your organization has uh, like say 10 different APIs, you can set up an API gateway in front of them and you can set up like say, okay, I want you to use this specific login functionality. That way you don't have to implement that login functionality on each of those 10 APIs. You just set it up once on an API gateway and all those 10 APIs are exposed using that API gateway. So it will help you do central management of all your APIs. You can do a lot more things like login was just one of the examples, but you can set up a lot more um, security related uh, settings or usage related settings. If you want to do some kind of monitoring or uh, specific logging that you want to do, you can do all that using API gateway. Um, yeah, so you will, it would, it, it's a lot of functionality that is provided for managing your APIs. You can create, publish, maintain, and monitor and secure your APIs. And you can expose RESTful APIs as well as WebSocket APIs using API Gateway. Any questions on API Gateway or VPC? No. Okay. Awesome. All right. Next, we have uh, security. Under security, um, first thing that comes is IAM identity and access management. So as I mentioned earlier, like it helps you set up your users. When you create your first AWS account, like uh, when you create it at that time, the email address or the that, that you use, that is called the root user. Root user has a lot of functionality, a lot of, lot of power, uh, which cannot be even restricted. So you, are, you can use that uh, root user for anything that you want to do, like, uh, and, the general recommendation by AWS is that you should not be using root user for everyday purposes. First create the account using root user, but then never again use that root user ever again. You can create and set up specific users for, for different things. Say you want to create one admin user and you want to create one developer user and or multiple users or things like that. You can do all that setup and then use those specific users for those specific functionalities but do not use root user again and again, because once that gets compromised, then, then it's really difficult to stop that or, or yeah, I mean, it can do a lot of damage basically. Um, so yeah, you get web services to set uh, access control to AWS services. So under IAM, IAM uh, service, you can set up your users and you can say that, okay, this user is allowed to do this and all that stuff. And the account creator, as I mentioned, is the root user. It has all the permissions, which cannot be restricted. And the best practices is like you create your AWS account and do not use root user again. So this is also a commonly asked question in the exam that uh, some of the best practices that are provided by AWS and you will see that, okay, what should you do with the root user? Basically never use it. So <laughs> that is something that you need to remember. All right, um, in the interest of time, anybody else, any other questions? I will start calling out names if nobody asks questions. Other than the people who have already asked, what about Ted, Tina, Miguel, Stephanie, James and Joseph have already asked some questions. And C. Augusto, Arjun, anyone? Okay, please, 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 yeah, ask some questions or, or you can start some discussion or something you can tell. Okay, awesome, C. Augusto, thank you. Yes, so far, so good. All right, okay. Next is uh, databases. So under databases, uh, I think a lot of people might, should already know about this. You have these different categorizations of databases, relational versus non-relational. Relational databases are uh, the our traditional ones mostly, like uh, SQL Server and Oracle, in which our um, data is stored in the form of relations or tables. Whereas non-relational, you have a lot more options and under non-relational, you will have a lot of uh, like 
even AWS provides a lot of non-relational uh, non-relational database services. So um, you have key value stores, you have graph stores, you have column stores, document, time series, ledger database, in-memory database. So you have a lot more options under non-relational and you will be covering them or seeing, like you will see that how these are provided by AWS as, as a service, which you don't have to worry about, like again, a lot of uh, deployment or patching or things like that. These are provided to you uh, as fully managed services by AWS. So you can just simply spin up your database and start using it without worrying about a lot of other things like patching or, or, or installing and all that stuff. Okay. Um, here is another link from one of the websites I saw uh, on the types of NoSQL databases, which I found really good. So I've added the link here. You guys can check it out. All right, so first one is RDS. And RDS stands for Relational Database Service. And um, under RDS, you get these six different options. So you can have Amazon Aurora or uh, MySQL, oops, sorry, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Oracle, and our favorite SQL Server. So you have all these options you can choose, like when you set up your RDS instance, at that time you can choose that, okay, this is the, this is the engine that I want to use. And you can do some configurations. You can set whether you want it to be encrypted, non-encrypted, or uh, this is what my root user will be. Sorry, not the root user, the admin user will be and, and all that stuff. So, so you can do that. And uh, one thing to remember or to understand is when you use RDS service is that suppose you want to scale it. You want to increase the size. Suppose you started with saying that I want a small instance and that was sufficient for your purpose in the beginning but now you want to make it like a bigger instance you want to use because you need more capacity, then in that case, you will have to either stop that service and, and increase the size or do some kind of backup and, and then restore that backup. So you do that like, it's not that seamless when you, when you do any kind of scaling for RDS. Whereas in case of other like fully managed services which are provided by AWS, this is all like a lot of things are automatically scaled where you don't even have to worry about setting these things or even turning them off or taking any backup and restoring them. You don't have to do all that. So this is again, commonly asked question in the exam. Um, then next we have DynamoDB. DynamoDB is the one that is provided by AWS and it's a NoSQL database um, and one thing that is really important here to understand is like it's very very cost effective if you were to use like if you were to store your data in say suppose sql server using aws and if you were to use that same data using dynamodb for example and if you can make it work for your purposes like suppose you don't need the tables or 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 you can make it somehow work you will see that the cost difference is huge DynamoDB is probably even one tenth or one twelfth the cost most of the times um, as compared to a traditional SQL Server database. So that is something that is like, I think AWS really wants us to use uh, this offering and that's why they have slashed down the cost a lot, but it's really and one of the most important topic for the exam also. So if you remember like Lambda was one of the most important ones and then second one is like DynamoDB. You will be asked a lot of questions on this. Um, as I mentioned, it's fully managed by AWS. It's NoSQL, non-relational, serverless service. It scales seamlessly uh, as compared to RDS. So you don't have to worry about uh, like, again, turning it off and turning it on again or restoring a backup or anything like that. All right, and very low latency. You will see that the performance is really amazing. And if you were to, uh, you can actually add a caching layer in front of it. It's called DAX, D-A-X, DynamoDB Accelerator. I think that's what its full form is. Um, so if you do that, it provides you caching also. And that cache is built specifically for DynamoDB only. And in your application, like if you, are, if you were to use any caching service, 
you will have to write your code accordingly that okay please hit the cash first and if the cash like if the cash if there is a cash hit then it's well and good but if it's a cash miss then you have to go and uh, go to the database and and fill that up and put that in the cash and then put and use that uh, data in your application in case of dynamo db with dax you don't have to do all that you have written your code to access dynamo db if you put uh, dax in front of it then your application code does not change you are still hitting dynamo db but it's automatically using dax for you and it's like complete seamless completely seamless for you to use that uh, that caching mechanism so it's really really huge and uh, you will see the benefits of that when you prepare for the exam all right then next one is elastic cache uh, elastic cache as the name suggests it's the caching mechanism it's in memory caching service you have two options you have redis and memcached uh, it again for any kind of other caching other than dynamo db you will be using elastic cache for that purpose and uh, you will be yeah you will have to uh, like you can get that all the benefits of caching using elastic cache it runs on an ec2 instance so you set up your when you set up your elastic cache you set the size of the instance and that decides the size of your elastic cache all right i think we are uh, almost towards the end i think i if i'm not wrong this should be the last one um, in terms of major topic like storage so under storage you have options uh, like for you have different types of storages based on what you are trying to store if you have object based storage if you want to use store some objects you will be using s3 if you are storing some files you will be using elastic file system where you can set up your rules and regulations similar to like file explorer so you will be, you will be using elastic file system and then you have elastic block store so if you are to use uh, like as for your amazon machine images for your ec2 instances you want block storage so that you can store like similar to our hard disk like uh, this is the amount of blocks or block storage i want to use you will be using ebs for that uh, under S3, you have a lot of options like different tiers or different types of S3, like S3 standard, S3 standard IA. Um, like S3 standard is by default uh, is by default use, but you have a lot more different types of storage classes which you will choose based on your needs. If you were to have some kind of data which is not frequently accessed, then you can probably put it in some archive kind of service which is S3 Glacier or S3 Glacier Deep Archive. And as you can see here, each of them has um, has different types of like uh, billing mechanism, your uh, different durability and different retrieval times. So based on your need, you will be using your appropriate storage class. And that is, again, something that you will be asked in the exam. Um, and everything can be accessed using REST API. Uh, so your S3 buckets are stored like the objects in your S3 bucket are exposed using uh, URLs. Like you can see that if you want to get any specific object or or anything like that, you will be doing that using your um, REST API works. So, okay, Lambda, DynamoDB and API Gateway are the three most important topics in the exam. And uh, just to remember that. And I think, uh, and then a lot more services, as I mentioned, it's like more than 175 services but these were the key ones. And when you prepare for the exam, you will see yourself that, okay, these are there are certain ones which are more important than others. And now, since we are towards the end, if anybody has any questions, they can ask before I start asking questions. Any questions, anyone? No. Okay. All right. First question. So the way um, my the quiz will work is uh, you will have to volunteer. One person will have to volunteer that. Okay. I'm the one who will be answering this question. Oh, I already see people are leaving already. Uh, <laughs> so you have to like uh, step up and say that. Okay. I will be the one who will, who will take up the next question. And then the volunteer will, will be uh, the question will be displayed and it will have four options. And the volunteer will try to answer that question. And you can also ask help from the audience. Anyone that wants to help, feel free to add it in the chat. 
um, and then that's how we all learn in a fun manner. All right. Awesome. Who is the first volunteer? Please display your, okay. Paul, Paul is saying he will volunteer. Okay. Awesome. Paul, congrats. You are the first volunteer. <laughs> uh, good job. All right. Oh yeah. One more thing. If you answer correctly, you can become a millionaire. Um, <laughs> Paul is like, no, I don't want to be, I'm already. <laughs> okay, first question. How does one provide which operating system to use for spinning up an EC2 instance? You set the operating system field in the EC2 instance setup. You choose the appropriate AMI. You copy operating system to the instance RAM or the instance takes the OS from the machine which is launching the EC2 instance. And Paul said B. Okay. Wow. Without any help. Okay. Awesome. That's exactly the right answer. <laughs> Good job, Paul. Very well done. Since no, I can't hear anybody else is clapping. Um, I'm assuming everyone is clapping. <laughs> All right. Next volunteer. Okay, see Augusto is saying that probably it's 11.30 p.m. in my time zone. Okay, yeah, me too. I'm in, I'm also in East Coast and for me it's 10.30. So sure, Augusto, if you have to, if you have to, then I mean, I can't stop you, but we are almost to the end. So up to you. We like, it won't take more than five minutes from at this point. All right, next we have Victor. All right, Victor, ready? Next question. A developer wants to deploy the code in a serverless manner without worrying about the machine where the code is deployed. What is the best way for the developer? EC2, ELB, RDS, or Lambda? And Victor said D, and that is the right answer. Awesome. <laughs> well done, Victor. Exactly. Awesome. All right. Next, we have Arjun. Arjun, ready, Arjun? All right. A developer wants to improve the latency in their web application. Which of the following services can help them? EC2, RDS, Elastic Cache, or Lambda? And Arjun said C, and exactly right. Awesome. Man all correct so far great um all right last question i think uh, this is the last question that i have who is the volunteer anyone miguel stephanie tina Uh, oh boy. Okay. James and Tina. Wow. <laughs> Paul also said yes. Okay. Okay. James and Tina, uh, since Paul has already answered one, so I will give it to both James and Tina. Uh, be ready with your answers. Uh, all right. Both of you. <clears throat> Fourth question, which object storage service is provided by AWS S3 RDS EC2 or Lambda? <laughs> James already said A, um, Tina also said A, wow, Paul also said S3 and I think exactly right, all three of you are exactly right. All right, awesome, awesome, well done, well done guys. Um, okay, so that means my presentation was awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that means that you guys were listening very good and uh, yeah, kudos to you guys. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. So resources, um, if you want to learn more about like how to clear the certification or if you want to pick up some specific training material, then you can, uh, you can use like uh, one of the Udemy courses. Udemy has like, there are three major player here uh, under Udemy. Uh, one is Stephen Marek, one is Neil Davis, and one is Ryan Krunenberg. He's from the A Cloud Guru. 
So you can you can pick up any of these three courses. Um, I think all three of them are pretty good. Like, um, but I think from most reviews or what I have heard from people, the first two are better than the third one. So if you were to get something like on Udemy, yeah, try either of these two guys, preferably. But you can make your choice. You get the preview, free preview, so you can try out. Uh, yeah, yes, Joseph. Yes, exactly. Stephen Merrick is one of my favorite instructors on Udemy. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. So you can you can try out, you can ch watch their preview and see if you like more or look at their ratings and reviews. Um, and then for anything else, like, yeah, you can try it out on your own, create your own AWS account and try to play around with these services. That is something that uh, that that you can't beat, like nobody else can uh, and nothing else will be better teacher like than you doing it yourself. So you can do that. Um, and then if you have some colleagues who have already done this, ask them for like, uh, like, okay, for certain services or certain things that you want to try out. And if you are getting stuck, so ask them for your, for, uh, ask them for help. So they can definitely help you out. Um, Use some mentor if you have somebody like uh, if you want to find out like say somebody can help you take the certification or help you prepare for the certification. So you can um, ask for that help also. I myself do that same thing. So if you want to connect with me, feel free to connect with me as well. And then there is a lot of practice tests, which is a must before the exam, uh, which can help you fill the gaps. Suppose you have learned everything, you have taken the course and you have done everything, but after that, at the end, definitely do one or two practice tests at, at a minimum and see how you are doing in those practice tests that can help you fill all the gaps that are that you something missed or something you thought that it was not that important while preparing. Like, uh, it, it doesn't seem that that important, but you might see that in the practice test that is asked again and again. So that is something that I learned from my own experience. So please definitely do the practice tests. They are also available on Udemy and they are, there are certain practice tests that are provided by AWS also. When you register for the exam, you will get the option that, okay, do you want to do some, buy some practice test also? So you can do that. Uh, that will really help you uh, pass the exam. Um, so yeah, I think to summarize, we discussed about why we should get AWS certified learn we learned some of the common uh, services in aws and uh, when you prepare for the certification you will get a lot of hands-on training as i mentioned earlier and people who got their correct answers please check your account balances uh, you must have been become millionaire by now i'm just kidding uh, don't quote me for that <laughs> okay all right um and yeah, we'll be happy to help. So connect with me if you have any questions, if, they, if you still have anything else, even after the presentation, I'm still here for five more minutes. Uh, if you still have any questions, you can ask me in the chat. And, but here is all my uh, links or all the way you, ways you can connect with me. I'm there on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, as well as email. So mm, that's all I had. Thank you so much everyone for attending and uh, taking out time on a Monday evening. Um, it's night for me here, but yeah, I think it's evening for most of you guys here. <laughs> so yeah, thank you everyone. I think a lot of people I saw were new today. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming in and joining. Any things that you want to say, Greg, before parting? Uh, no, no, I just mostly just want to say um, just to, to build on what you were saying I'm, and thanks to you to you a ton. That was a lot of really awesome content, um, you know, and really concisely covered. Like like you said, AWS has nearly 200 services um, and a new one seemingly every other day with a similar name and a weird logo that doesn't really make any sense. Um, so being able to distill that down is, is a non-trivial task. So. I uh, really appreciate you you taking the time, um, especially knowing that it's it's a few hours later there than it is here. Um, you know, really appreciate that. And, and thanks to, as always to, to everyone for, for attending um, and participating. Like it's, a, it's way more fun to do these things when there's a lot of inbound questions and interest and participation. So, oh, you know, from as an organizer, uh, that, that really means a lot. So really appreciate everyone participating and hanging out. 
Um, we'll post a link to the video and, and content and everything in the next couple of days in all the normal places. Um, and hope to see you at a future meeting. But until then, um, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you soon. Have a great night, folks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg.